Uh, so I'm Charles Bullock from East Bay Municipal uh, Utility District. Welcome to the, the last presentation of the day. Thank you for uh, uh, sticking around. Um, go over some of the house cleaning, uh, the, or the house shop, or the, what do you call it, house cleaning duties? Housekeeping duties, thank you. Number one, safety. You always guys hear me talk about this over and over again. So if there's a fire, you guys know the two exits from this room, right? To your right and to your left. So if you come out this back door, you're going to go out on the alley right here. Then we're going to go over to Yerba Buena Center to the carousel. I'm going to ride the, uh, the giraffe. My kids like giraffes, so I'm going to be on the giraffe over there. If you go out the front door, head down to your right, meet in the same spot. If there's an earthquake, duck cover and hold. Please don't leave the building until the shaking stops, until somebody says it's safe to leave because we don't want anything from the outside of the facade to fall down on top of us. Um, the, the showcase is presented by um, the U.S. Green Building Council, East Bay Municipal Utility District, the USGBC, the Architecture Institute, and San Francisco, or excuse me, Pacific Gas and Electric, the Pacific Energy Center that you're in here. Um, presentations will be available online in about one week, and we do have them uh, recorded. Um, trying to think of maybe the CEUs. I'm going to get to that slide right now for those that want to. Uh, record that. So there's the number up there for that one. Got to look at my notes here. I think I'm forgetting something else. You guys, you've heard me say this before. What did I forget so far? <laughs> yeah, if you haven't found it by now, you're in trouble. So, <laughs> But they're outside, straight to the left. Good one. Um, and the evaluations. Please don't evaluate me. Evaluate the speakers. <laughs> So we're going to do it like we did last year, do Survey Monkey. So in about a week, we're going to uh, send you a Survey Monkey. Please take the time to fill them on out. We really do appreciate it. If you need to take notes on pieces of paper, please do. We, we read every comment. We really try to make this the best event we possibly can. We do take everything to heart. So please take the moment to write things down and, and fill that out. And I believe we're going to be giving a raffle away to X amount of people that, for, for every X amount of people that fill out the survey, there's going to be a raffle. Like there will be after this last session, we're going to have a raffle in this room as well. So I think with all of that said, I can get to my introduction. So you guys know you're all here for uh, impact on climate change on street trees in California, right? Okay. So uh, Dr. Joe McBride is Professor Emeritus at uh, uh, Forestry and Landscape Architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. His teachings include courses in forest, forest ecology, landscape ecology, urban ecology, Urban Forestry, Hydrology, and California Landscapes. That, those are a lot of courses. <laughs> Research by Mr. Professor uh, McBee involves studies of forest succession, air pollution impacts on the forest of Southern California, characteristics of the world's urban forest, the reconstruction of urban forest in Europe and Asia after World War II, and the impact of climate change on urban forest in California. Please put your hands together to welcome our pre presenter. Thank you. Oh, we have lots of room down here in front if some of you would like to move in closer. Uh, you said that in but, school too, right? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> if you're comfortable, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see so many of you here. Uh, some of you are my former students. I'm both pleased and surprised. At the end of the semester at Berkeley, uh, students have to fill in an evaluation. One student once wrote, if I learned that I had only one hour to live, I would want to spend it in your lecture. It would seem like an eternity. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I hope this doesn't seem like an eternity. Uh, I think we're... There we go. Uh, I want to talk to you about some research that I have done with a, uh, a former graduate student of mine, Igor Lacan, uh, on uh, trying to evaluate uh, how climate change is going to impact street trees in California and what we might learn from this uh, that we could share with cities across the state to advise them on what trees should or should not be planted. And so what I will do uh, in this uh, 50 minutes or so will be to review current information on climate change to identify the impacts on the physiology of trees and then to report on this analysis of street trees in California uh, and their potential impacts. If any of us uh, is unaware 
let me show you these headlines from the San Francisco Chronicle uh, that attest to the fact that it's getting warmer, uh, not only in California, but in other parts of the world. For the last three years, uh, the uh, uh, summer temperatures, uh, uh, high summer temperatures uh, in the northern hemisphere have exceeded the temperatures of the previous year. So 2018 set a record that broke the 2017, or I should say 2017 broke the record that was set in 2016. And so we, we are facing uh, a, a change uh, in our climate. Uh, there are a number of models that have been developed uh, by various uh, researchers uh, to look at uh, how this change in climate will be distributed over the state of California. And this particular set of maps by KN uh, indicates that uh, the increase in temperature will be more uh, greatly felt uh, in the Central Valley and in the southeastern desert portions of the state. Uh, the state of California developed uh, a software pro program called CalAdapt uh, that would allow you to go online and put in a, a location just any place in California and see uh, the results of a, a series of different models, they actually present five models and the average of those models. And looking at this CalAdapt model, uh, the temperature in Berkeley is going to increase about five degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, between the averages that were set between 1961 and 1990 uh, and about the year 2099. Uh, similarly, uh, these models allow us to uh, project precipitation and uh, there will be for Berkeley about a uh, uh, something on the order uh, of about a uh, f four or five degree uh, decrease in precipitation. Uh, other models have looked at uh, the snowpack. I'm sure you're all familiar with the snow surveys. Uh, they're being reported uh, uh, now because of the, of the drought we thought we were in. Maybe we've recovered with this uh, most recent storm. Uh, but uh, a projection, again, of snowpack suggests that by the end of the century, uh, uh, depending on where you are in the Sierra Nevada, there's going to be between 48 and 65 percent less snowpack. And that snowpack is extremely important uh, for many of our uh, coastal cities uh, because we don't have mountains that accumulate a snowpack and most of our water comes uh, from uh, the Sierras. And so if we're going to have decreases of 50 percent or more, it's going to have a real impact on water available uh, for landscaping. To sort of sum all this up, we're going to be facing extreme heats in some parts of the state, and we're going to uh, be facing no water, particularly for residential uh, landscaping purposes. Well, the second topic that I want to uh, put forth is to, to relate this change in temperature, change in water availability uh, to uh, trees. And I want to talk about uh, two processes, photosynthesis and transpiration. Photosynthesis, as you know, is the conversion of carbon dioxide into sugars uh, that takes place in the leaves of plants. And this is a typical curve showing the relationship between temperature and photosynthesis. Photosynthesis increases slowly uh, above a low cardinal temperature and then goes through a period of very rapid increase as the temperature becomes warmer and then has a bit of a, an optimum uh, range uh, beyond which it gets so warm and then uh, photosynthesis begins to drop off and reaches a, a high cardinal temperature where the plants no longer photosynthesize. Uh, another important uh, physiological process is respiration. And the curve for respiration, as you can see, is quite different than the curve for photosynthesis. It climbs up much more slowly, uh, has a somewhat more narrow optimum range, and then drops off very abruptly. Uh, if we overlay these two graphs, we find that there's a crossover point for most temperate zone tree species of around 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, the carbohydrates that are produced by photosynthesis are being consumed by respiration. And they're turning those uh, glucose molecules uh, back into uh, carbon dioxide 
and water. Uh, beyond this temperature, uh, the, the plant is running out of uh, resources, if you will, uh, for uh, doing any repair work on their foliage or other parts of the plant. The plant is getting into a, an area where if we're experiencing prolonged periods of time above uh, this crossover point, uh, the plant is going to become damaged. And we can see that uh, in the leaves of trees. Uh, these are London plane trees that are suffering from heat damage and the margins of the leaves are dying uh, in part because of the uh, utilization of the products of photosynthesis, also in part at higher temperatures because of the coagulation of proteins. Now, if we look at uh, the impact of water stress on uh, these processes, we have somewhat different curves. Uh, if you can uh, sort of single out uh, this blue line curve here, uh, it shows uh, the effect of uh, decreasing water available availability, what's called water stress, on that process. Uh, water stress is measured by plant physiologists in terms of uh, a unit called a, a bar. And out to about minus 10 bars, uh, the transpiration process uh, continues at 100%. Out around that level of stress, which is a rather minor level of stress, the stomates begin to close. And as they close, uh, there's less water vapor losing the leaf. And that accounts for the drop uh, in the blue line. Eventually, the stomates close uh, and uh, uh, stomatal transpiration is shut down. There's some water loss leaving through the cuticle of the leaves. So there's a little bit more, even if we get out to minus 40 bars of, of water loss. Uh, but uh, the significant break point is the point at which the stomates close. Now, if you look at the green line, that's a line for uh, photosynthesis. Uh, it remains at 100% up to a stress level of about minus 10 bars. Beyond that point, it starts to drop because as the stomates are closing, they're cutting off the supply of carbon dioxide. And without carbon dioxide, the chloroplast can't make the sugars. Uh, the photosynthesis continues to drop. Uh, it will continue after the stomates are fully closed. Uh, because there's some carbon dioxide left in the interior of the leaf, but eventually it, it goes to zero. The black line represents uh, respiration. And like the other two lines out to about minus 10 bars, a, a minimum level of stress, it operates at 100%. And then as the, the somates begin to close, uh, it, it drops uh, in, in part due to limitations of oxygen stays at about a 50% rate until the water, the leaf becomes very stressed. Uh, and then uh, the leaf releases the number of enzymes that break down the carbohydrates to adjust the uh, 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 osmotic concentration of the leaf. This allows respiration to go up very high uh, until it runs out of uh, resources and then it too drops. Uh, out at the far end when the tree is uh, in uh, suffering, if you will, from uh, lack of water, uh, things are really breaking down. And so we see water deficit injury uh, initially just a wilting of the leaves, but then that can be followed by a uh, necrosis of the leaf tissue of the margins. And so uh, from a whole tree standpoint, these two impacts of higher temperature and uh, lower water availability will result in uh, a considerable loss of the canopy foliage of a particular tree. Uh, this can lead eventually to uh, death of the tree. From a standpoint of uh, uh, a landscape architect or an urban forester, one of the important impacts of that is a lack of shading. The tree on your left uh, was a tree along San Pablo Avenue in Berkeley, California. Uh, I took this picture uh, three years ago at sort of the height of the drought, and it had lost about 90, 95% of its foliage, and the only shadow it's creating on the street is the shadow of the trunk. The tree on the right had been watered by a local merchant during the drought, and it retained its leaves, and it's providing an important function by shading the sidewalk, by shading uh, portions of the street. And this service that is provided by trees in cities is very important 
in affecting, uh, in, this in this particular case, urban heat islands. So as our trees are beginning to uh, suffer uh, from high temperatures from drought, uh, their ability to provide urban services is going to be lost. Well, let me turn now and talk to you about uh, this study looking at the impact of, of uh, climate change on street trees in California. Uh, this study involved looking at uh, 16 cities uh, in California uh, and uh, comparing uh, their temperature patterns and uh, their uh, street tree composition. And a, a method that it, I adapted from the field of forest ecology is a method uh, for studying plant succession, forest succession, that's referred to as substituting space for time. And it is one of two methods that have been used uh, in trying to understand uh, how the vegetation will change over time. One of these is called a direct observation. And in direct observation, the ecologist establishes a plot, uh, marks it so he can come back to it, come back to it, records the vegetation on the plot and puts that together over time if he lives long enough or if she lives long enough uh, to uh, make a story out of the change that is taking place. Unfortunately, uh, we don't live that long because sometimes these changes are worked out over uh, 100 years or more. Uh, there are a number of studies now in different parts of the United States where permanent plots established in the 1920s are still being followed, but it'll take many decades to come uh, to a conclusion on those plots. The other method is substituting space for time. And in this method, the ecologist goes out and <clears throat> finds areas on the landscape that have been disturbed by the same factor at different times in the past. And these are, this method of substitution of space for time is often used in studying forest succession after a fire. So you find areas that burn 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, that are on the same uh, site, so to speak, in terms of soils and aspect. Uh, and then from that, you infer uh, a, a pattern. Uh, the zero year plot, the plot that burned last year, uh, you will infer will look like the plot that burned 20 years ago. And what was burned 20 years ago will look like the, uh, in another 20 years, like the 40 year plot. And then there's just an inference, if you will, uh, of this uh, procedure taking place on the particular uh, piece of ground you're interested in. Now, there are problems with this approach. And one of these problems uh, is that you really have to have similar vegetation before the disturbance, and you have to have similar conditions. You don't want to be carrying, comparing north-facing slopes and south-facing slopes or redwood forests to Douglas fir forests. In the urban landscape, uh, one of the, the problems is that the cities to be compared uh, either have to be initially planted with the same street trees or have access to the same plant palette uh, when the city was being developed. Uh, in addressing that question, uh, I uh, in, uh, looked at uh, bird's eye views of California cities. In the uh, latter part of the 19th century, California was a, a boom town uh, that was trying to attract uh, people from other parts of the United States to come uh, and uh, buy real estate, uh, bring their families, and live in California. And part of the campaign in doing this was to have artists prepare these remarkable bird's eye view maps. This was before we had uh, drones, before we had aircraft. Uh, the artists were amazing in their ability to uh, walk uh, an area and figure out what it would look like from above. Uh, and uh, these uh, bird's eye view maps were distributed in the eastern United States. Uh, in the uh, uh, late 1870s, you could ride from Chicago to Los Angeles for one dollar. The railroads were complicit in this effort to get more people to come to California. And we had a reputation of being a, tr a uh, a, a treeless landscape. It was a real concern about the Easterners when they got here that there weren't any trees. And so these bird's eye view maps often emphasize the fact that developers had come in and had planted trees. Uh, the uh, uh, upper map is of Sacramento and it shows the 
Uh, the native trees along the waterfront in the city, it's a little hard to see in the background, but the streets are planted in the background. In the lower right is a portion of a bird's eye view map uh, from Oakland, California, uh, showing uh, many blocks that have been laid out, the streets have been laid out, uh, and the uh, trees have already been planted uh, in these trees. Uh, Tom Brown, uh, who did a study of the nursery industry in the uh, 19th century, uh, stated that uh, by 19, pardon me, by 1890, 95% uh, of the trees uh, that are found in California cities today were for sale at various nurseries around the state. Uh, and then in interviews with uh, three nurseries currently operating in the state, uh, they reported that since the 1960s, uh, the, the whole tra wholesale uh, tree nurseries have supplied cities all over the state. Uh, that uh, when uh, we're talking about uh, street tree planting, we're not talking about an individual going out and buying a single tree, but cities, uh, as subdivisions were developed, the developers were buying hundreds of trees and they were buying most of those from uh, three or four statewide nurseries. Uh, so I have made the uh, conclusion based on this that as these cities were developing, they might not have had the same palette of trees planted, but the same palette of trees were available to all of these cities. Now, my use of this uh, method of substitution of space for time uh, involves looking at uh, a, a city uh, and uh, using the CalADAPT program to determine what the average maximum July temperature would be in that city. Fresno, for example, currently the average July maximum temperature is 95 degrees, and by uh, 2099 it will be 108 degrees. It will increase about uh, something on the order of 8 degrees. And so in looking, uh, using uh, CalADAPT, uh, I found that uh, the city of uh, El Centro has a current temperature of uh, 108 degrees. So I'm saying, well, maybe we could go down to El Centro and see what their street tree population looks like. And uh, if there are trees that are currently growing in Fresno, maybe we should stop planting those trees or at least find out why they're not being used uh, in El Centro. So for example, if we have these five street trees on your left in Fresno and we go to El Centro and find that a species B, D and E are missing, then we might make the assumption that they're missing because it's too hot or they don't have the uh, water availability for those particular species. So uh, I set about to select example cities that were examples of the different climate zones in the state, select a comparison of city. The comparison city is a city that has the same temperature today that the example city will have in 2099 and then to compare tree species. There are lots of cities and towns in California to choose from. And so I used three select selection criterion. Uh, one was the temperature average, uh, maximum July temperature for these cities. A second was the size of the city. I wanted to have a city that was large enough to have an ample tree population, to have a street department or an urban forestry department that was taking care of trees and then finally, I wanted the city's location to be somewhat typical of the landscape of that particular climate region. So uh, one of these zones is climate zone 12. It's sort of in the central of the uh, center part of the Central Valley. And I looked at the temperatures of four cities uh, in that and uh, chose uh, Stockton as being somewhat close to the average. Uh, the next thing was to look at the size of cities. There's a lot of variation in size here. Uh, I thought uh, Sacramento was just uh, so much larger than the other cities that I would uh, select uh, one of the other three. I thought Woodland was maybe a bit small. So again, Sa Stockton was uh, selected. And then in terms of geographic location, uh, Stockton really sort of fits uh, the, the landscape of uh, that portion of the Central Valley. So for climate zone number 12, uh, Stockton was the example city. And these are the other 16 example cities that uh, I selected uh, using this particular process. And they're shown here again on this map. 
and maybe it's a little easier to uh, recognize them uh, in this particular list. Now the next step was this selection of the comparison city and by aligning the uh, historic average maximum temperature uh, with the predicted uh, average maximum temperature, uh, I came up with a, a, a chart that looks like this. So Eureka is going to go from about 62 degrees up to about 69 degrees. Uh, a town like, uh, shall we say, uh, El Centro is going to go from 106 up to about 116, about a 10 degree increase. And so just by visual analysis, I looked at this table and said, well, the climate in Eureka in the year 2099 is going to be very similar to the climate in Berkeley today. And so I selected uh, the city of, of Berkeley as a comparison city to Eureka. And here is Ukiah, and it uh, will have a temperature similar to what Fresno has today. Get down to the bottom of the list, I kind of ran off the chart, but uh, to my salvation, there's Furnace Creek. And you, 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 you may not think of Furnace Creek as a prominent California city, but the advantage of surf, uh, Furnace, Furnace Creek is that they've tried over 50 different tree species to get some shade in that city. Uh, they uh, they <coughs> have, uh, as I recall, something on the order of maybe uh, 10 or 11 tree species that grow there now. Uh, this was a, a work facility set up by uh, miners uh, that were trying to mine borax and they uh, had a lot of men staying there and they wanted to try to improve the comfort of that location. Uh, and they tried very hard, but they, the point is that they did test a lot of tree species and they have a record of that. So these are the warm or comparison cities as they should be called uh, for the cities in the study. And the next step then is just to compare the tree species in this city, in these cities, and that uh, resulted in uh, needing to conduct a street tree survey. And so uh, to plan this street tree survey, I laid a grid over the map of each of these cities, excuse me, and selected from this grid uh, 50 points at random, uh, and then uh, <coughs> uh, placed my sample location at the nearest street intersection to that point in the grid. And then at each of these points, uh, I laid out uh, eight plots uh, to, uh, north. surprisingly, most of the cities in California are on a north, south, east, west grid. So two on either side of the street, these plots were 10 feet wide and 100 feet long. And if there was a medium, they were included uh, depending on the direction. So the next step was for my graduate student and I to go to these cities and start counting trees. Uh, and we did. Uh, and th this is the result of that count of the cities, the 16 cities we looked at. Uh, Ukiah had the, we encountered the greatest uh, diversity of trees uh, in our survey, 85 trees showing up. And Bar so, pardon me, El Centro uh, only uh, had uh, uh, 28 species. And these are those species. What you see here uh, in part is the prominence of London plane tree. Uh, it was the most common tree we encountered in four of these 16 cities. Uh, we also uh, found that uh, the other uh, more common tree uh, was uh, crepe myrtle that we found in two of these cities. But for the rest of the cities, uh, there were uh, different species without overlap. Uh, now, if uh, we take, for example, the city of Berkeley and its uh, comparison city, uh, we uh, looked at uh, the uh, temperature comparisons, and then we compared the street tree lists that we had generated from the survey. And we found that black locust, uh, Chinese elm, Chinese pistache, purple leaf plum, and trident maple uh, were not uh, in the Santa Ana survey. When we went to Santa Ana, we did not encounter that particular tree. And this was typical of, uh, of many of our surveys. These bar graphs show that uh, cities uh, like uh, Berkeley, uh, we didn't have all of the uh, street trees. The black shows the number of trees 
that are present in the comparison city uh, as we had in the city. But we had some cities like Eureka, some cities like Santa Ana, San Diego, in which all of the street trees were also in the comparison city. And then we had some cities like Riverside, like Barstow, in which maybe 20, 25% of the city's uh, trees were not in the comparison city. Uh, so uh, this uh, gave us basically uh, a, uh, a starting point. We realized that for the city of Berkeley, there were other cities in addition to the comparison cities that were even warmer. And they're shown here in this sort of pink color. Uh, for example, our comparison city of Santa Ana uh, has a 82.3 uh, degree uh, maximum July temperature, but Burbank has 86, Riverside has 91. And so when we looked at our list from those other cities, we found that although we could not find black locusts in Santa Ana, uh, we did find it in Yuba City and Stockton and Fresno and Susanville, all of these cities that have a warmer temperature than the predicted temperature for Berkeley. So we came to the conclusion that uh, these top 10 species in Berkeley uh, are going to survive uh, the climate change uh, because we found them in, in cities that have even warmer temperatures. Uh, that was not the case uh, for some of the other climate zones. Uh, Stockton uh, has a predicted temperature of 101.7. We compared that to Barstow, uh, and we found that Bradford Pear, Common Hackberry, London Plain, and uh, Sweet Gum uh, were not in the Barstow survey. We did not find those trees in that city. And so when we looked at the warmer cities of El Centro and Furnace Creek, we also found uh, that uh, those trees were missing in an even warmer city. So we would come to the conclusion initially that these four species, Bradford pear, common hackberry, evergreen ash, and sweet gum, uh, were unlikely to survive or perform well as the climate changed in Fresno to become the climate of Barso. And this is an overall graph showing that many of the cities, uh, the, uh, the zero uh, represents that uh, there, uh, none of the trees commonly used in those example cities uh, are going to be affected by this change in temperature. But there are those listed at the bottom in which there are losses of up to 90% of the existing tree canopy. And if you look at those on the map, uh, the, the red boxes are the climate zone numbers, uh, and uh, they are showing the climate zones in which our comparison suggests uh, that uh, trees would not do well uh, as the temperature got higher in those cities. Uh, two questions sort of can be raised by this research. One is, uh, could the absence of these species uh, in the comparison cities be due to factors other than climate change. And then the second question, a little more apropos to you guys, I think, is uh, how should we factor in decreasing uh, 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 soil, pardon me, decreasing available moisture uh, in, uh, in this analysis? And so we used uh, three methods uh, to address this. One was to interview arborists in these cities. A second was to check the suitability of the cities or the species for growth in the predicted climate zones. And we use Perry's book, uh, Landscape Plants of California, in which he identifies plants for different uh, climate zones in the state. And then we use Wukul uh, for uh, analysis of the water needs of these plants. So if we could go back to Stockton as an example city here, uh, we had these 10 top species and our initial survey suggested four of these uh, would likely not survive or not do well. So in uh, interviewing uh, local arborists, uh, they, they agreed. They said either we tried that and it, it just didn't, didn't make it here. It didn't grow very well or it, we just couldn't keep enough water to keep it alive. And, and we agreed that it's not going to do well here as the city of Stockton gets warmer. Uh, we also looked at uh, <clears throat> Perry's analysis and uh, two of these, uh, the common hackberry and the evergreen ash, 
uh, Perry said they would be okay. They ought to grow in this area. Uh, but we, we tended to sort of lean toward the experience of the local arborists rather than Perry's uh, recommendations uh, on that decision. Uh, the, the, the third thing was to look at water requirements, and these water requirements uh, shown, uh, these irrigation requirements in the, in the, the uh, alphabet letters are shown below. And these indicated that a London plane tree, which has a, a medium to high irrigation requirement, uh, is a tree that we might consider not recommending for planting in Fresno in the future because of its higher irrigation water needs. So combining all that information, uh, we basically came up with five species, the four that we had identified from our survey uh, and the London plane tree as trees that we did not think should be planted uh, anymore uh, in Stockton. And here's a sort of a balance sheet for that. Although Perry suggested that we put two species back on the list, uh, we uh, favored the arborist view of this and didn't. And then we added the, the uh, one uh, London plane tree because of its water requirements. So for the uh, different uh, climate zones in which uh, we, uh, we found uh, an absence of certain trees uh, in their comparison cities, uh, this is a chart showing what those species are, and again in pink, the city of Stockton and its five trees that uh, are shown there uh, were ones that we felt were not going to do well as a result of increasing temperature and decreasing water availability. So the consequence of this is that we now have trees in some of our cities that will continue to decline. Some of them will die uh, as the climate becomes uh, warmer and drier and uh, they're not going to perform very well as urban trees as a result of the impact on uh, their physiological sy systems. Uh, these are the trees uh, that uh, were on that list for two or more cities in the state, and their trees are probably familiar to most of them. So our bottom line is that these cities should stop planting these trees. It, it costs a lot of money to plant these trees, uh, I'm reminded of the, uh, the singer uh, Bono, who in his early career uh, played in a lot of bars in Glasgow, Scotland. Those were tough places to play and sing. At that time, he was very much a conservationist, very concerned about the death of elephants in Africa. So he would sing a song, and then he would stop, and he would clap. And he would say, every time I clap, an elephant dies in Africa. And some drunk in the back of the room shouted, stop clapping. <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to yell from the back of the room, stop planting these trees. It's a big investment, and if they're not going to do very well, we really need to be looking for trees that are going to be uh, better adapted uh, to the climate. We need to begin processes. And some of that work has been started by the U.S. Forest Service in their uh, Climate Ready Trees program that's centered in Davis, California. They've selected about 25 species from Mexico, from parts of Arizona and Texas uh, that uh, do very well in much drier uh, landscapes. And so they have a, uh, a test garden uh, in the Bay Area. They have one in Sacramento. I think they have three in different parts of Southern California. But it will be a while before the results of those uh, particular studies are out. So I think we, we could and we're developing a website where a city could uh, call up this website and we would identify a, a list of trees for that climate zone that we do not think they should continue to plant. So uh, that uh, concludes uh, my uh, presentation and I do have uh, a contact information there if anybody would like uh, to contact me via email. And Thank you. <laughs> So we do have to time for a few questions. Go around the room. Thank you very much. Very enlightening and very helpful. The one thing that seemed um, omitted to me was uh, no quercus, not one oak. And sudden oak death uh, is uh, 
almost uh, ground zero on the Berkeley campus, and you have I am one of those people who's been following and going out and measuring that. Can you uh, enlighten me? Um, what percentage of um, impact will that have in terms of killing existing trees? And well, I, yeah, that's a gap in our study. And, and there are other uh, tree diseases uh, that uh, are going to affect uh, the uh, eventual population of street trees. With regard to sudden oak death, uh, I'm uh, undecided as to how these changes are going to affect that disease. Uh, I, I had a study going at China Camp uh, in the, the uh, early part of the uh, 2000s, uh, and I set it up uh, just before the drought, and during my five-year observation, none of the trees died. In fact, half of them got better. Uh, and uh, this is spread by a, a, a pathogen, uh, the, the spores of which land on the bark of the tree and they really have to have a fairly damp uh, uh, situation for those spores to germinate and grow. So uh, maybe we'll see less impact, but I, I would agree that we really need to think about addressing uh, what we know about uh, diseases and how climate change might affect them in this analysis. Not, not to overburden you, but the last meeting they said the product that was used, not the seedlings that are or yes. um, nurseries have been infected. And this year, 11 different states across the U.S. bought from the same source. So now it's going to be a national disaster. Yeah, no, that's terrible. Question? Well, somewhat following up on that, um, down in Silicon Valley, there's been a, a slight movement or some some papers coming out talking about kind of re-oaking the valley and, and yeah. you know getting much more of these native species as opposed to some of these less so. Um, if you could speak to that a little bit more. you know. Well there's a great experiment going on uh, at the new Apple facility uh, where uh, a local arborist, uh, trying to remember his name, uh, brought in uh, trees from Mexico. He uh, 15 years ago, uh, started testing trees on his own property, uh, oaks in particular, uh, from Mexico and parts of Texas. And so he's incorporated a lot of those into that landscape. And that may be a very useful uh, place for observations. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think locally, uh, individual arborists are, are, are recognizing the problem. Uh, they're doing work to test things out. Oh. One more? Sure. So I'm also um, just about to finish the book, The Secret Life of Trees, which I think is absolutely fascinating and I've been loving it. And I think what you presented is fascinating as well. Um, and in that book, talking about street trees and um, the lack of the micro rhizomes to the bacteria to help support them and also um, maybe not having uh, many of the same species next to each other so that they can share resources and, and work with each other. Any, any thoughts on, on how, I don't know, that, that type of thinking or incorporating that into street trees might be able to help offset some of this? I know it's completely out of the scope no, of the no, study, okay. but you know, no. your thoughts? Well, uh, I, I guess probably all of you are familiar with mycorrhizal fungi. These are fungi that are set up a symbiotic relationship with a vascular plant. And the part of that relationship results in increased uh, accumulation of uh, important mineral nutrients, uh, increased water uh, uh, absorption by the tree. And uh, those mycorrhizal fungi uh, are not transmitted with a seed. In other words, they, the, the seed has to germinate and grow in a soil that uh, has in that soil those mycorrhizal fungi. And so uh, Caltrans in its landscaping of uh, freeways uh, are very conscious of this and uh, they require nurseries to inoculate certain species with mycorrhizal fungi. But that's not a requirement in general that cities or that nurseries would do. And so that would be one relatively easy step uh, to, to really enhance the possibility of trees surviving. Uh, trees do 
share resources, uh, trees of the same species, uh, and uh, there's uh, been a lot of work to show that they keep each other alive. Uh, the, there are different viewpoints as to uh, how the biodiversity in our cities should be designed. Uh, some, some people feel that we should have uh, uh, a variety of trees along the street, no tree repeated along that street. But there are great streets throughout the world that are monocultures, if you will, uh, that were planted to a single species. And because of the form, the color, and the texture, those are outstanding streets. So I think we could uh, increase urban biodiversity of street trees by doing it on a block by block basis rather than a tree by tree basis. And that might allow then some examples of mutual support. I've been monitoring. Uh, trees uh, along uh, medians uh, in three boulevards in Berkeley. I started uh, at the beginning of the drought. And I cannot figure out why this tree died and that tree died, other than they're plugged into the sewer system or what. Uh, but in many cases, you, where you find three trees of the same species in a row, they did pretty well. Whereas if you find an isolated one, it's not doing as well. But I think there's, there's a lot we could learn from that book, from that concept. I, I have a question. I, we had a presentation here, I'm not sure how many of you got to saw it, about uh, maybe seven years ago back, and this gentleman from Minneapolis, and, and they talked about they had a lot of mono, uh, mono trees, they had the elm trees, and the Dutch elm disease came out and just you know wiped out blocks and cities. But one other thing that he, he mentioned in uh, their study, and I'm not sure if you touched on it on yours, is Oftentimes, cities are very prescriptive that this vault for this tree needs to go into a four foot by four foot cube, and it doesn't give the tree a lot of resources or to go on. So in your study, did that also, um, did, I mean, did you take that into account as well? Like what environment's living in? No. Okay. Yeah, but that, that is a, an important factor. Uh, in the residential areas of most of these cities, uh, that we looked at, there was a four foot wide planting strip that was a block long. Yeah, I have a background in public works and I, I've been to a lot of small cities who largely have tree boards made up of local residents and maybe one certified arborist um, for, for that city. And they re tend to rely on these these Bible books for street trees for Southern California or, you know, cities got their own. But, it, you know, largely in the public sector, we're copying what one another are doing. And I think that. More times than not, we have folks working in the public works department making decisions about which trees go where, um, unless there's a, an actual meaningful plan in place. And so I guess my uh, comment is, what do you think about having more collaboration between different tree groups and things like the APWA, where you have uh, public works you know, societies that are coming up with standards for tree wells, right? So you're addressing both the installation, uh, getting the right soil mixture, I mean, you, you get a, just a huge variation on that. And to me, that, that's creating the right environment, but also then removing, you know, the trees that don't work well. Um, and uh, just kind of, do you see any relationship or any interaction going on there? Well, I, I think it would be advisable to have more people at the table and uh, not to just limit it to uh, the street department uh, officials, uh, I think there's a tendency among those officials to not be very experimental and not want to take very many risks. And so I think that's one reason why we see so many London plane trees in our city. It's a tough tree. Uh, if you can water it, it doesn't have very many problems uh, in the urban environment. Uh, and if you go uh, around the United States or uh, uh, different cities in the world, you see more and more, particularly in older European uh, cities, uh, a, a shrinking palette of trees that are being used in the city, being shrunk down to those that have been successful in the past. But the past is uh, changing and it's going to get warmer and so we need to somehow influence uh, that thinking uh, to get these people to realize that what might have worked the last 50 years may not work very well in the next 50 years. Sorry. I, I, just, I just thought of this question. Thank you. So in some cities, um, climate change is going to make it colder. 
um, you know, like in Europe. So, so I wonder if there's cert studies going on about hardier trees that can, you know, withstand like really cold and then the hotter summers, if you've seen any of that. And then the second part of the question is, I read somewhere recently that San Francisco has not a very high percent of tree c compared to other cities. Is that because of the history that you talked about that we had been treeless or that was my okay. so two questions. All right. Uh, let, let me start with a second question. Uh, San Francisco has a, a really unique uh, history uh, because of the, the gold rush. There was a bird's eye view map drawn of San Francisco uh, in uh, 1845 or 46, and there were like 300 people living in the city, and there were maybe six streets, and you know it was just this empty place, so to speak. And then overnight, you had thousands of people, I think. It went from 350 to 500 in a year, and from 500 to 5,000 the next year, and within five years, it was 30,000 people. And there was a huge demand for housing. And so, unlike cities in the eastern United States, uh, the, the housing within, without any front yards, they put in the streets, they put in the sidewalks, and then they built these multi-story structures to deal with the, the lack of housing. And so then, in the 20th century, uh, as uh, utilities began to get undergrounded, they put them under those sidewalks. And so that really limited the space for trees in San Francisco. The last uh, uh, paper I read on this suggested that the tree canopy cover in San Francisco is about 11%. That compares to New York City, which is 25%, to Atlanta, Georgia, which is 35%. Uh, so we're w way down on the scale. Uh, but we're way down on the scale in part because of the layout of the city and the fact that we just can't dig holes in the sidewalk because the electric lines, the uh, utility lines are there. And so we haven't really, there, there have been some attempts uh, to look at bulb outs where we'd take a parking place and use it as a tree pit, but a lot of uh, conflicting interests on that kind of space. Now, remind me of your first half of your question. Oh yes, yeah, no, not to my knowledge. Uh, th this is a, uh, a concern that was raised by people who reviewed this research that I've done. And we went back and looked at uh, the hardiness zones of these trees and the projected temperature as well as the daytime temperature goes up, the nighttime temperature goes up. So we're not going to have as frequent or as many killing frosts in these cities as we do today. Uh, but uh, there, there is some concern that uh, for some tree species, particularly for fruit tree species, that uh, they need that cold winter temperature to induce uh, flowering and fruit production. And so uh, this may be a problem uh, for some of the flowering trees that we use in our cities today, that they may not get cold enough in the winter now to produce the flowers. but. Yes. Um, I was thinking about Yuba City and its comparison city. I think you said it was El Centro. Yeah. And the difference in uh, in rainfall. Um, it seems like even even in you know 2100, Yuba City might still be getting more rainfall than El Centro is today. And so I was wondering if generally in these in picking these comparison cities, if the rainfall also, the predicted rainfall was also pretty close um, uh, well, uh, to what it is in the comparison city now, or not. If it was uh, really only a temperature it, that was it's, similar. It's close, but depending on what it is now, it, it becomes significant. In other words, if you're in a place like El Centro and you're going to have a, a, uh, a reduction in annual rainfall of a half an inch, and you only get two inches a year. You know that's that's important. Uh, but in places where there may be a, a well, Eureka is a good example. It gets 58 inches a year. Its rainfall is going to reduce by five inches. That's really not going to affect any of the trees that are there. 
But as you go into the drier parts of the state, I think this becomes a factor. For a lot of cities, though, I think it's the snowpack that's going to be the important thing. That you know. No, my my question is more: is is the comparison city truly a good comparison? If um, your original city is still going to be getting quite a bit more rainfall, wouldn't that you know change some of the effects of the well, higher it, temperature? Well, it is, but the cities that we we studied are not going to get more rainfall. They're going to get less rainfall. Does that make sense? Yes, I know, but they won't get as little rainfall as their comparison city. Yes, okay, yes. I see what you mean. Yeah, so. uh, I need to think about that. Oh. It's a, a good point. Are there any other questions offhand? Oh, uh, you want to pass that down? Thank you. Is there any chance of adaptation of some of these species? I know trees have different lifespan than we do. Uh, but some plants do adapt very quickly. Um, I don't know about trees and if they can make some adaptations in the 80 years that you're projecting your study to. That, that's a very good question, and I, uh, I don't have an answer to that. But, you know, we have trees in some of our cities in Los Angeles and San Diego that have been there for almost 200 years now. Uh, and so... Uh, that would be a very interesting question to test. Uh, one would assume that uh, over time uh, there would be some genetic selection uh, that uh, has taken place. Good point. Well, thank you. For help me uh, put your hands together one more time. Thank you. And if those of you who did the passport, we'll do the raffle in this room in around 15 minutes. So if you get up, we want to take a little break, and then we'll meet back here in just a bit.